something I'm thankful for <clears throat> that perhaps you are as well is that you and I cannot be made to worship anything, whether it be something that some believe should be worshiped or not, we have that freedom of choice. And because we have that freedom of choice, hopefully we'll never find ourselves in a position such as what uh, Daniel's close companions found themselves in, a position where the government had essentially set up an idol, and having this idol set up, they were to, with all, once this symphony played, to have bowed down and worshiped the gold image that the king himself had set up for all the people. But one of the things that you notice if your Bible's open to Daniel chapter 3, picking up at verse 8, it says, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, Lear and psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, haven't paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. As we read in the book of Acts, also we see here uh, that the question was posed in the book of Acts, decide for yourself, should we obey God over man, or rather man over God? Uh, and, and, and here you see it lived out, the, 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 the essential command that you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. And so that when government made a decree that was contrary to the faith of the Jews, Three of those whom were referred to by their Babylonian names and not their Hebrew names uh, were three who essentially refused to do the very thing that was commanded throughout the empire. And because of that, they're about to fall into some heat with the powers that be. And so when the pressure comes, what will be made of it? When the pressure comes, what will you do? And so essentially, to cut through the quick of a lot of Scripture... The king is angry and calls for them to his presence, and when they come, he inquires of them about this very matter. And one of the things that they say, if you look at the end of verse 15, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? He gives them almost an opportunity to proclaim the message or the person of the God of Israel. What God will save you from my hands? And this is exactly what he would learn. But there's a point and a key concept that I want you to not miss in this. And that occurs in verses 17 and 18. They reply to the king. They say, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In the midst of all this, what I really want to focus on are simply three words that appear in this verse. But if not, they said with confidence, with faith, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this fiery furnace, this trial at hand, and also from your hands, O King. But if not, let it be known to you that we will not worship your idols. Now, in the grand scheme of the story, we go, yes, absolutely, amen, hallelujah, God can save. But something that they were willing to consider was what if God chooses not to save? And you say, why is that a focus? Because that's what we often as Christians ignore. We believe that God has the ability, we believe that God has the power but we don't always know if it's his pleasure, his timing, his will to deliver us from whatever is at hand. And so the reality is, we don't like to think about, but if not. And so when the reports come and we hear and the prayer requests are made, we pray for the best possible outcome according to the flesh. 
Deliver this one from illness. Deliver this one from bondage. Deliver this one from addiction or whatever the case is. But what if not? What if God doesn't heal? What if the marriage isn't saved? What if the business will not be salvaged? And on and on. We don't like to think about, but if not. It's almost as if we want to think the absolute most positive outcome, and we pray with that in mind to God, and we think that is how He's going to deliver us. But it doesn't always work out like that, does it? Have you ever prayed for someone to be healed, and then they're not healed, but rather they go on and they pass away? Have you ever prayed for uh, someone to be freed from a circumstance of life that seems to be holding them down or seems to be hurting them in some way, and they never find that deliverance? Now, the easy response to that is to get mad and to blame God. Well, if God was all-powerful, he would do this, that, and the other. But one of the things, as I mentioned this morning, God is never late, but we have to trust in his timing. And we also have to trust that no matter how hard the reality may be to accept, and I'm not going to say that every outcome is God's will. Sometimes things just happen as a result of us living in a world that is stained and tainted with sin, and the outcome isn't always what we would hope for. But God is still King of kings and Lord of lords. And even though I may not fully understand, the one thing I do not doubt for one second is his goodness. I'll never doubt his goodness. And sometimes even in the worst of circumstances and the worst of outcomes, we can still, if we can peer through all that is there, we may be able to find some good. Sometimes we can't, and I understand that. But we don't like to consider or think about, but if not. And the reality is, many of us live in a circumstance here or there where, but if not, is the reality. We have prayed, we have prayed, we have prayed, we have done everything in our power we know to do, but we never considered, but if not, if God doesn't give this as we wish it to be. And sometimes that's our reality. And sadly, for some Christians, the but if not can destroy them or us if we don't face it. And so when you think of a scenario, you think about what is the worst possible result that could come from this. When several years ago, my aunt had called me, we were ministering in central Kentucky, and my aunt had called me one day, and I believe it was a Wednesday, as a matter of fact. Uh, about midday, she said, Stephen, I need you to come here to the hospital. And I said, okay, what, what's going on? She said, it's your mom. It's not good. And it, I, I was almost numb. I, I said, well, what, what's the matter? What's happened? She said, we don't know. She called 911. Uh, they had to break in the house. She was sick. They took her uh, to the hospital, and they think she's had a brain aneurysm burst. And I said, really? I said, was well, she okay? Well, she's alive. I said, well, you know, is she alive, first of all? Yes, she's still alive, but we don't know what is going to be. Okay. So I hopped in my car. I called an elder, called Stephanie, and I was racing down the road, talking on the phone, things that you shouldn't do, but saying, here's what's happened, here's where I'm going. And... Um, <clears throat> you know, get down there, and, and she was in surgery, and so I stayed there, and, you know, luckily she, she survived it, but, but the worst possible outcome would have been, well, she doesn't survive, she dies. And that's kind of scary to face. Okay, if she dies, what then? Well, if that is to be what is to be, my prayer was partly focused on, you know, God forgive her for her sins. I pray that she's in a right relationship with you. I pray that you would welcome her into your presence by the blood of Jesus. You know, the, I, I, so my prayer goes from God, I don't know what's going on. You know, save her. Please help her live. But if not, forgive her. Cleanse her. Uh, you know, 
welcome her into your presence. And that would have been a whole changed reality. Now, we know how this story ends with Daniel's three friends. They are cast into the fiery furnace because they refuse to bow down to the God that has been erected, and they refuse to do so at the appointed times. However, this story has a good outcome. The but if not wasn't the reality. The but if not wasn't even present. But when they are cast into the burning fiery furnace, there is one who appears like a son of man who saves them from this. And the result is, well, they don't have a fiber singed of their garments, and they don't even smell of the smoke of the fiery furnace. But there are a few occasions in Scripture where, but if not, was the reality. Job was just but one, and he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Most of us knowing, being familiar with the story of Job, how he really was one of the wealthiest men that ever lived. He was also a very righteous man. Sadly for Job, there was something occurring in the heavenly places, a discussion between God and the adversary, Satan. And it almost seems, if you read it, that they're playing a game with Job. Uh, and, and the more I read Job, the more I'm subject to misunderstand what God had in plan or at play. But really, I don't think it was so much about Job as it was so much about proving to Satan the sincerity of Job's faith. Because Satan kept saying, well, you know, the only reason he's faithful to you is because you've given him everything. The only reason that he's faithful to you is because you have protected him from hardship. If you will let me go and accost all his goods, then he's going to betray you. And God says, well, okay, see if you can make it happen, but don't touch him. So Satan does that. He takes all of his possessions, takes all of his children, sadly perish, and then... He comes back and, and, and he says, well, you know, okay, he didn't deny you this time, but now it's skin for skin. If, if you let me harm him, I can get him to deny you. And God says, okay, you can afflict him, but don't take his life. And so Satan has the go at Job, and, and, and Job is afflicted physically, though he's not dead, probably wished that he would have been. And after all this, Job never denied or blamed God for what occurred And he even would say not long after everything happened to him, even if God slays me himself, I will trust in him. What a statement to make. Now, I don't know about you. Somebody tries to slay me, we're going to have some problems. That's how most of us think, isn't it? But I think Job had the faith that I aspire to have, similar to Abraham. God told Abraham to go and to sacrifice his one and only son. And Abraham did it without question, without dispute. But there are a few other times where the but if not became reality. When David had lain with Bathsheba and had her husband killed on the front of battle and she turned up pregnant. God had sent Nathan the prophet to confront David because of his sin. And David was made aware of his sin. He repented. He asked God for forgiveness But the outcome was to be, the son born to you and Bathsheba will not live, Nathan says. And so David fasts and David prays, asking God to please have mercy. Don't take the boy's life. But he never considered that God would say no to that prayer. And that little baby died. Another example of a but if not is Paul's thorn in the flesh. We read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The apostle said, I pleaded with the Lord, or I besought the Lord thrice. Three times I asked him, take this away from me. But we don't read of him considering the but if not. Rather, what we read is an answer that the Lord gave to him. My grace is sufficient. Another occasion, Jesus in the garden, agonizing over what he was about to suffer. If it be possible... Take this cup from me. But if not. So we have at least three examples from Scripture where people of faith, immense faith, prayed to the Lord for something that was occurring in their lives. And God said no. The but if not became their reality. 
And so I think from these occasions, we might be able to learn how to handle the but if not realities that may come at us on occasion. And we look at each of these cases to see what happened in the aftermath of God denying them their prayer. Now, first of all, with David and Bathsheba, the child did pass. And what was always astounding to me was after that happened, David got up, he fixed himself up, and he took food. And even his servants were surprised at this. You know, only a few moments ago, he was weeping, mourning. He wouldn't take any food. He was of such a state, none of us wanted to go near him. And so they asked him, Master, why are you now the way that you are? And so David had a new outlook, and his new outlook was, I can't bring the child to me, but I can go to him. The but if not is the reality. The child is deceased, and I can't think of anything worse to ever happen to a parent or a person alive than to have to bury a child. I can't think of anything worse happening, and I know some of you, dear friends, have had to do that very thing, and I'm so sorry for you. If I could do anything to take the pain away, I would, but there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can say, except I'm so sorry that you've had to go through this. But David looked at this with promise and said, I can go to the child. And the reality for David is the same for us and those of you who have had a similar reality. You may still go to where they are. With Paul's thorn in the flesh, his outlook was, I'll boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I remember when my Graham, who had multiple sclerosis, lay in her bed in the last years of her life. And my granddaddy would have to feed her a can of Insure a day through a dropper that parents gave their children medicine from. I remember any time I ever visited her, her never complaining, her never being negative. And even when she could barely speak, she was always positive and upbeat as much as her strength would allow. I remember one time going to her and a little child, and I used to love it. She had this little chihuahua. That was the fattest dog I think I've ever seen because she was blind, couldn't see, and she still would try and cook, and she dropped everything on the floor that she made, but the dog's name was E.T. Y'all remember E.T., don't you? That, that, that home, right? You know what I'm talking about. Well, E.T. made sure to clean the floors. E.T. was a good housekeeper, but E.T. was fatter than what you could think of, and uh, she'd be on her bed, and little E.T. would be up on the bed with her, And I walked in one time, I was 13, maybe 14, and she had a little chair that you could sit right there next to the bed, and and she was telling me this one story. I think Granddaddy for for, uh, Christmas had bought her silk pajamas. And she and and I, I noticed I said, Graham, you're not in your, your new pajamas that you're in. She she started laughing. She said, I can't wear them. I said, Do they not fit? She said, No, I slide out of the bed every time I wear them. And so she said, so I have to wear the cotton pajamas. Another time I'd go visit her, and uh, if granddaddy would be there, you'd always, he'd answer the door, let you in, and you'd go, well, how is she? And he was always honest. Most of us, we go, well, you know, they're, they're hanging in there. If she wasn't having a good day, he'd say, boy, she's not having a good day. And there are a lot of times he wouldn't let us see her. If, she, if it was a bad enough day, he'd say, boy, I'm glad you came, but she's had a bad day. You don't need to see her today. Okay. But sometimes you'd go, you could go in, she'd be laying in her bed, and you'd, Graham, how are you doing today? What a silly question to ask of some people, isn't it? Well, how do you think they're doing? I remember one time her answer, and I've never forgotten this, she said, I'm just praising Jesus. That was it. And so me, had I had what she had, I might have been the worst patient imaginable. Just ask Stephanie about when I get one of those alleged man codes, how bad I am. So you can imagine me having something that I live with day in and day out, how bad it would be. But Paul asked God to take away this infirmity of his, this thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient, the Lord says. And so Paul replies, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Jesus' perspective, we read before he even concluded his prayer, not my will, but yours be done. But if not, isn't anything we like to think about. But if not, sometimes becomes the reality. And so can it be that through the saints who have gone before us, who have had to live with the but if nots of their circumstances, that we can take strength and realize, you know, it doesn't have to crush your faith. It doesn't have to cause you to abandon the Jesus in whom we have believed, but that our outlook can change. That doesn't erase the pain. It doesn't change the reality but it can help us put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward in the grace of our sweet God. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, as we enter a week that is meant to be joyous and a week that is meant to be one of happiness and celebration, we remember those, Father, among us and those who are not even able to be with us tonight who are living realities that make this week less than pleasant. And for them, Father, I pray that you will visit them with your kindness. I pray that you'll visit them with your compassion and with your love. I pray that they can have a a sense of comfort and a sense of peace in the sweet memories of what once was, be it the loss of a loved one, be it the loss of health or the loss of a job or perhaps the loss of uh, a marriage or anything. Be with them and comfort them during this time. And Heavenly Father, help our faith to grow, to increase, that we can face whatever may come, entrusting the circumstances, the situations, and even ourselves to you. You are sovereign. You are above all. You have created this world. We know there's nothing out of your reach to touch, to heal, to help us to overcome. But if not, but if not, If we shall face it, Father, help us to not be destroyed by it. This is our prayer, and we pray such in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.